Hi, everyone. For those of you who don't listen to my other show, Unchained, I've been running a series of essays there by people in the industry as I near my book deadline. Emily Parker of Longhash agreed to do one whose length is better suited to Unconfirmed. Although this was mostly written before the market crash of last week, it's quite timely, given that crypto assets didn't exactly behave the way many thought they would during times of financial crisis. With the soul searching that's taking place in crypto right now, Emily's thoughtful essay titled Blockchain Tech's Story Problem and How to Solve It looks at what crypto is about, how we communicate that to outsiders, plus offers some critiques and suggestions to the industry. It's a great jumping off point for conversation, so I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Tweet at me or email hello at unchainedpodcast.com. My Twitter handle is at Laura Shin. And now, enjoy Emily Parker of Longhash reading Blockchain Tech's Story Problem and How to Solve It. Why should you get an MCO Visa card from Crypto.com? First, it's a beautiful metal card. You can top up the card with crypto and spend anywhere Visa is accepted. You also get up to 5% back on all spending. You know they'll pay for your Spotify and Netflix, too. You'll love the unlimited airport lounge access and interbank exchange rates if you travel a lot. eToro is one of the largest trading platforms in the world, with over $1 trillion in trading volume on the platform per year. U.S. customers can trade the most popular crypto assets with transparent fees. Create an account today at eToro.com. That's E-T-O-R-O dot com. Crypto.Law, a.k.a. Kelman Law, is a New York law firm run by some of the first lawyers to enter crypto in 2013 with expertise in litigation, dispute resolution, and anti-money laundering. Email them at info at kelman.law. At cocktail parties, people always ask me, what does your daughter do? My father recently told me. When I tell them you work in the blockchain industry, they go blank. Or they associate Bitcoin with the dark web. I try to explain, but it's no use. I have had countless versions of the same interaction. Step outside of the crypto bubble and say the word blockchain, and you will often hear smart and sophisticated people say things like, I tried to understand it, but then I gave up. This mental block, so to speak, has real implications for an industry whose success largely depends on network effects and public participation. The coronavirus has only made the problem worse. Some of us were drawn to blockchain because of Bitcoin, the digital currency that made the technology famous. Bitcoin appealed as a money that existed outside of traditional markets, and could act as a safe haven from financial turmoil and irresponsible governments. But recent events have put that narrative to the test, to put it mildly. The coronavirus crisis led Bitcoin to crash right alongside the stock market. If Bitcoin can't act as a reliable safe haven, then what is the purpose of blockchain's most visible ambassador? The lack of a clear storyline may not have mattered during the 2017 crypto boom. Back then, the market was so frothy that a company could raise money just by saying the word blockchain, even if hardly anyone understood what it was. But now that the market has cooled, some may back away from a technology they view as opaque. Not long ago, I heard of a multi-million dollar deal falling apart because one of the parties shut down upon hearing the word blockchain. These observations aren't purely anecdotal. A CityGate Do Rogers survey on global professional investors asked about the level of understanding of blockchain technology by senior directors at large established businesses. More than 50% of those surveyed said their understanding was poor or very poor, with 0% describing their understanding of blockchain as excellent. Is blockchain tech really that complicated? Sure, if you are trying to master it at a technical level. But the average person doesn't need to do that. They just need to grasp the general concept. Bitcoin, 
is a good place to start. For the purposes of this essay, I will often use Bitcoin as an example because it is by far blockchain's most famous use case. I usually explain Bitcoin and blockchain like this. Bitcoin is a digital currency and Bitcoin transactions are recorded on a blockchain, which is a digital ledger that is not stored in one single location. Bitcoin's blockchain is updated by people all over the world and can be viewed by anyone. Every block of data is linked to the one before it, meaning that tampering with the data will compromise the chain. Blockchain technology allows huge sums of money to flow around the world without the intervention of a government or a central bank. If my summary isn't the best, there are plenty of other articles, books, and explainer videos out there but they just don't seem to be getting through to the general public. The question is, why? Here are a few reasons. First, blockchain doesn't have a storyteller. The blockchain industry has a storytelling problem because there is no one designated to tell its story. The milk industry spends $46 million a year to tell the story of milk, milk, the pistachio industry spends $55 million a year to tell the story of pistachios. Tamika Tillman, chairman of the board of the Global Blockchain Business Council, told me. Tillman added, The blockchain industry has been trying to ram through adoption of what is arguably the most complex mass market technology in history, with effectively zero investment in coordinated industry-wide storytelling. When it comes to public understanding of new tech, you get what you pay for. Tech products, you could argue, need even more of a marketing effort. The tech industry has tended to spend more of its revenue on marketing than other industries, and with good reason. Its products are often new and complex. They require some explanation. Marketing teaches people what the products do and tell stories about how products can fit into people's lives. Consider, for example, the ads for the original iPhone. Today, Apple can do all sorts of things to appeal to emotion with its ads, because most everyone knows what an iPhone is and what it does. But the ads for the original iPhone were just quick product demos, showing you what the phone actually does. People needed that explanation, because this was a new thing. If the iPhone was a big leap from the flip phone, it's certainly fair to say that Bitcoin is quite a leap from a dollar bill. And while it's possible to seek out an explanation of what Bitcoin is, you have to be inherently interested in Bitcoin already to do that. By contrast, Apple marketing finds you. Those iPhone ads were everywhere. There was a good chance you saw a few, even if you weren't interested in the iPhone or had no idea what the iPhone was. There's no coordinated marketing campaign to let people know what Bitcoin is. Given that Bitcoin's value as a currency will be largely defined by the number of people who actually use it, this is a pretty big problem. The decentralization that makes blockchain so revolutionary can be a liability when it comes to messaging. Second, we don't know what story to tell. Even if the industry miraculously united around one story, which story would it even be? Again, take Bitcoin, whose narrative is far from straightforward. When we say Bitcoin, what exactly are we referring to? Bitcoin the currency or Bitcoin the network? If it's the currency, what exactly is its purpose? Is it a long-term investment or a get-rich-quick scheme? Is it a safe haven from traditional financial markets? And if so, then why did it recently crash with the stock market? Or should Bitcoin be used as an actual currency that can pay for actual things? Meanwhile, apparent contradictions abound. In countries like the United States, Bitcoin may seem dangerously volatile, 
and a way for an uninformed investor to part ways with a lifetime of savings. But in places like Venezuela, Bitcoin is a relative anchor of stability amidst political crisis and rampant hyperinflation. The truth is that Bitcoin can be all of these things at once, but that just doesn't make for the most coherent story. It also doesn't help that Bitcoin's creator, Satoshi Nakamoto, has completely disappeared. Some people know Bitcoin as a private form of money that is good for making secret transactions. The first problem with this narrative is that it's not even really true. Bitcoin transactions are much more traceable than the average person might think. But even so, who exactly is benefiting from Bitcoin's relative privacy? Criminals who want to conceal their tracks? or brave dissidents who are trying to protect themselves from authoritarian regimes. The other problem is that privacy doesn't necessarily sell. Niraj Agrawal, the director of communications at Coin Center, put it this way. The biggest storytelling problem seems pretty simple. Privacy is not a top of mind issue for most people. And for those who think about it, the convenience trade-off for privacy is too high, Agrawal told me. And yet Bitcoin, for all its challenges, still has the clearest story of any other blockchain-based token. Ethereum, the second most well-known blockchain, is even harder to explain to the general public. Amanda Kassat, Secretary of Marketing DAO, an organization that is helping to grow the Ethereum brand, told me that Ethereum's technical people are not necessarily communicators. They love talking to other technical people. The kind of terminology they are creating is going to resonate with more technical people, Kassat said. And the whole concept is just a little harder for people who aren't computer scientists. Crypto.Law is run by crypto OGs in New York who understand crypto and fintech. They were already operating in the space back in 2013, and they accept crypto as payment. One of the partners, Zachary Kelman, is known for drafting a bill submitted to the U.S. Congress in 2014 aimed at exempting on-chain Bitcoin transactions from U.S. regulations. The other founding partner, his brother Daniel Kelman, became well-known in the crypto law space for his work in the Mt. Gox civil rehabilitation. So if you operate a fintech business or have a dispute with some person or business involving crypto, or you just need legal advice related to crypto, info at kelman.law. That's K-E-L-M-A-N dot law, or just go to their website at www.crypto.law. When you think crypto, think Kelman. Are you interested in getting into the cryptocurrency markets, but don't know where to start building your portfolio? eToro has the answer for you. It's called Copy Trader by eToro. With CopyTrader, you can automatically copy every trade of eToro's top crypto traders at the exact price in real time. No need to study up on markets or develop your own strategies. Simply sign up and copy the trader of your choice. Any profits they make, you do too, proportional to your investment. With eToro, you get access to the world's most popular cryptocurrencies with transparent trading fees, all in one easy-to-use app. Copy the smart money with eToro. Join now at eToro.com. That's E-T-O-R-O dot com. Third, the industry isn't helping itself. Some of these problems are legitimately hard to solve. But at the same time, the cryptocurrency industry is not helping itself. Instead of trying to communicate a larger vision, Many are consumed by petty infighting about which tokens are best. And even as much of the world has no idea what Bitcoin is, startups are spending their time writing nonsensical white papers and promoting products that even industry insiders can't understand. Blockchain conferences are flooded with jargon and empty terms like ecosystem, which SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce aptly described as a word people use when they don't really know what they're trying to say. Anthony Pompliano, founder of Morgan Creek Digital, said that the use of jargon can represent a deeper problem. 
In a conversation on his podcast, he told me, when you get inside of crypto, my best test for founders is, tell me in two sentences or less, what do you do? And if you can't do it, or there's any sort of technical jargon or whatever, I'm not interested. And some of it is because you can't articulate what you do. And also, the other piece of it is because you probably don't do anything. Finally, does blockchain have a storytelling problem or just no story to tell? Blockchain technology has yet to touch most people's lives. And even the best marketing campaign is not going to fix that. Marco Santori, president and chief legal officer of blockchain, a software platform for digital assets, put it this way. There's not a lot of ready-made end products for consumers today, Santori told me. That's changing rapidly, and I think we're going to see a very different environment soon. But today, there's not a whole lot to sell just yet, Santori said. Just look at the numbers for decentralized applications, or dApps, which are basically apps or software built on a blockchain. According to State of the DApps data as of mid-March, out of the more than 2,200 DApps that it tracks, only one had over 10,000 users in the past 24 hours, and only five DApps had a seven-day total volume of above $10 million. In late 2019, the Wall Street Journal reported that around 9 million Bitcoins, or slightly over 50% of those outstanding, hadn't moved in at least six months. Use of Bitcoin by merchants went up in 2019, but remained a tiny fraction compared to credit cards. Blockchain technology is being used by major corporations. The retail giant Walmart is one pretty big example. But these stories don't seem to be gaining much traction. Some crypto purists will say that these use cases are not real blockchain because they are not truly decentralized. Others will question if some of these companies need to use blockchain at all. Nathaniel Popper, who covers technology for the New York Times, told me, it is so hard to tell whether anyone is actually using a blockchain for something that they couldn't have done with their existing systems. People have an incentive to say that they are using blockchains because it seems innovative, Popper said. If more people were using blockchain technology in a meaningful way, they might not need to understand it. Hardly anyone can explain the technology behind the internet, but they don't need to because the internet is an indispensable part of our daily lives. Blockchain's lack of real life use cases help explain why some people have a negative impression of cryptocurrency. In a recent New York Times article, Popper reported that even as Bitcoin's value was sagging, the amount of cryptocurrency spent on so-called dark net markets rose 60% to reach a new high of $601 million in the last three months of 2019. Until more people experience the positive impact of blockchain technology, negative crypto stories could dominate the attention of policymakers and the general public alike. So what can we do? Cryptocurrency doesn't and shouldn't have a centralized marketing firm. So it's up to the industry to tell its story. Here are a few suggestions for how we might do a better job. One, make products that people actually want. Some of the most important work may lie with entrepreneurs and developers. For blockchain technology to truly touch ground, it needs to be applied to products that people actually use. If a startup can't concisely describe its product and the problem that it is attempting to solve, then does the world really need that product? And does that product even require blockchain at all? Startups 
and investors should be constantly asking these questions. A surplus of convoluted and esoteric products is not doing the industry any favors. Two, lose the jargon. If you have a product that does add value, put some effort into telling its story. Some startups confuse storytelling with marketing or paying huge sums of money for self-promotion. Storytelling, by contrast, is explaining clearly what your product is and why the world needs it. Some good ideas may never get funding because investors have no clue what the founders are trying to say. It's also startling how the creators of some consumer-facing products don't see the need to explain their product to actual consumers. Don't pad your white paper with technical jargon and empty prose. Stop using industry cliches like ecosystem. Many technical people are not natural storytellers, and that's fine. If you're not a storyteller, then hire someone who is. Three, coordinate the message within reason. The blockchain industry is decentralized. There's no getting around that. There are many blockchain-based tokens, and we can't expect them to unite around a common story. But the different players can work on better coordinating the messaging of their specific communities. Let's also cut down on infighting and toxic maximalism. It's good to name and shame scams and nefarious actors, but it's not helpful to publicly trash tokens or key crypto figures just because you don't like them. These divisions add to public confusion or cause people to tune out completely. Reasonably coordinated storytelling could have benefits for everyone, regardless of what project you are working on. It will be difficult to get people to use blockchain technology if they don't understand what it is or why it should even exist. Don't forget, next up is the news recap. Stick around for This Week in Crypto after this short break. Why should you get an MCO Visa card from Crypto.com? First, it's a beautiful metal card. You can top up the card with crypto and spend anywhere Visa is accepted. You also get up to 5% back on all spending. You know they'll pay for your Spotify and Netflix, too. You'll love the unlimited airport lounge access and interbank exchange rates if you travel a lot. There are so many cool perks loaded in one card. Download the Crypto.com app now. Hi, everyone. Wow. This past week in crypto and in the world overall is nothing like any of us has ever seen before. I hope you and all your loved ones are safe and healthy. And when you have a choice that you're all doing your best to social distance. I also want to thank all of my listeners who work in healthcare. Thank you. Thank you so much for working hard to help us fight this virus. And I'm glad to see that many government leaders are also stepping up to the plate. Thank you as well. Now, let's turn to the crypto news of the past week. First headline, Coinmetrics. Short-term holders drove Black Thursday volatility. As I'm sure many of you know, last Thursday was a crazy day in the crypto markets. When Bitcoin plunged to as low as 3600 on BitMEX and could have possibly gone even lower if it hadn't been for BitMEX going offline for maintenance, Coinmetrics had a good analysis of the types of sellers who were driving Black Thursday. Using on-chain data, the analytics firm showed that the vast majority of activity in Bitcoin on March 11th and 12th involved Bitcoin that had been held for less than a year. With about 281,000 Bitcoin that had been untouched for 30 days going back into circulation versus only 4,300 Bitcoin that had been untouched for at least a year being revived. Among the other metrics they evaluated, one was the market value to realized value, which compares the crypto asset's market cap to its realized cap. The realized cap is an estimate of the asset's aggregate cost basis. Coinmetrics says, quote, BTC's MVRV, 
fell by 0.5 on the 12th, which is the largest one-day drop since December 2013. In hindsight, the past periods where MVRV drops below 1 have been the best times to accumulate BTC at a relatively discounted price. Next headline, Santiment, Ethereum Hodlers Hurting. Santiment, a cryptocurrency behavior analytics platform, did a similar analysis to the CoinMetrics one, this time on the Ethereum blockchain. Santiment found that all MVRV cohorts, short, mid, and long-term holders, are down on their initial investment in ETH. They also looked at whale behavior in Ethereum and found that many at first dumped into the rally, but then bought back in at the bottom and then dumped again. However, retail investors have been accumulating at between uh, 0.1 and 100 ETH. And developer activity on Ethereum has been unaffected by Black Thursday and is even up slightly. Next headline, MakerDAO's Crazy Week and Controversial Solution. On Black Thursday, MakerDAO underwent a massive stress test, only it was the very real plunge of ETH by 50% in a few minutes. Because many of the Maker Vaults are collateralized by ETH, this sent users scrambling to avoid having their Maker Vaults liquidated. Unfortunately, the Ethereum blockchain was congested at this time, so a lot of liquidations weren't even getting included in blocks. Some very clever and opportunistic traders took the opportunity to liquidate vaults with bids of zero ETH, but they paid higher gas prices to be sure that those trades would be executed. So they made off with what one research firm, White Rabbit, says was $8 million. One of the emergency measures MKR holders adopted was to usher in USDC, a stable coin that's backed by actual dollars in reserve, as a collateral type, among a few other solutions. But not everyone welcomed USDC as a new collateral type. Kane Warwick of Synthetics tweeted, When I woke up this morning, Ethereum had two permissionless stablecoins. Now we have one. And Eva Balin tweeted, Die has died. (laughs) She spelled it D-A-I-E-D, which, yeah, maybe because I have to explain it in audio form, it's not as funny. But anyway. All right, next headline. Backed raises $300 million Series B funding round. Bact announced that it had raised $300 million in Series B capital from Intercontinental Exchange, Microsoft's M12, PayU, Boston Consulting Group, Goldfinch Partners, CMT Digital, and Pantera Capital. The company also updated its website to give a sneak preview of the app that it plans to launch this summer that hopes to give new life to loyalty and rewards points, in-game assets, and cryptocurrencies. Frank Chaparro of The Block says in an analysis that the retail app couldn't come at a better time. Given the drop in airline stocks due to the coronavirus, he notes that the app will enable people to convert their airline miles into cash and writes, quote, Airline points remain a big liability on the balance sheet of banks. The ability to convert points into cash reduces airlines liability. Next headline, Wither Bitcoin Mining Post Having. Coindesk reports that the Black Thursday Bitcoin price crash is casting a pal over the upcoming halving, calling into question whether mining firms will continue to be profitable. The article says, quote, According to data from Mining Pool Poolin, even the most efficient equipment on the market, such as MicroBT's What's Miner M20S and Bitmain's AntMiner S17 Pro, is generating daily profits at a gross margin below 50%. The co-founder of Poolin said that prior to the price crash, he expected Bitcoin's hash rate would gradually rise, but that now he expects computing power on the network to decline by up to 30%. Fun bits. Steemit to execute hard fork to excise Justin's son's Steemit. If you had whipped out the popcorn to listen to my unconfirmed a few weeks ago with Brady Dale about the war between Justin's son and the Steemit network, You'll be interested in this update. By the time you hear this, the Steema community may have already hard forked into a new chain called Hive in order to remove Steemit, which was recently acquired by Justin Sun of Tron. 
The fork is scheduled for 10 a.m. EST on March 20th, which is just several hours after this podcast is published. Binance and Huobi announced that they plan to support Hive, and the price of Steam tokens has gone up. Thanks for tuning in. To learn more about Emily Parker and Longhash, be sure to check out the links in the show notes of your podcast player. If you enjoy these news recaps, then why not sign up for The Real Deal, the weekly newsletter I publish every Friday. Some of you have asked me for the links to the stories I mentioned on the show, and now you can get them delivered right to your inbox. Go to unchainedpodcast.com right now to sign up. Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Fractal Recording, Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, Josh Durham, and the team at CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening, everybody, and stay healthy.